morning, church. Won't you stand and let's sing as we gather this morning. intentions all my obsessions I want to lay them all down in your hands only your love is vital though I'm not entitled still you call me your child Oh God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Oh, God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. I give you control. Had plans shattered and broken. The things I have hoped in will fall through my hands. You had plans to redeem and restore me. You're behind and before me. Oh, help me believe. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Oh, God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. You are. Somehow you want me, the King of Heaven wants me. So this world is lost, it's grip on me. You want me, somehow you want me, the King of Heaven wants me. So this world is lost, it's grip on me. God, you don't need me. But somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Oh, God, you don't need me. But somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. I give you control. Give you control. I want to give you control. I give you control. Cause you want me. Somehow you want me. The King of Heaven wants me. So this world is lost. It's grip on me. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for demonstrating your love for us in Jesus Christ, for sending Christ to die for us, to be resurrected for us, even while we were sinners, God, even though we do things that are against your kingdom. Would you call us to be a new creation in Christ? And Lord, I pray that as we are gathered here, as your church gathers throughout the world, that you would make us one. Help us to know that you are trustworthy in every circumstance, and that we may give you everything we have. And we pray and ask these things. In the name of Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, and all the church said. Amen. Amen. Well, you can be seated. Welcome to Northside Community Church. So glad that you're here today. Certainly want to extend a special welcome to those who may be joining us as a guest today. The seat in front of you is a Connect card. All you would need to do is just fill that out, drop it in the offering box at the end of the service today. If you have a prayer concern, we'd love to know how we can be praying for you as well. All you would need to do is just fill out that same card. Let us know how we can be praying for you, and we will certainly be doing that in the weeks ahead. Really glad you're here this morning. A couple of things to share with you. Next Sunday is our Chest to Joash Sunday, and we'll be sharing a little bit more about that later on in the service. But just know that that's coming up next Sunday. Partnership 101. If you've never made the 
decision to join the church, that opportunity is coming up on Tuesday night. We have a class at seven o'clock. Still not too late to sign up for it. You can sign up in the kiosk, at the kiosk in the lobby and let us know you're planning to attend. I know we've got some folks already signed up planning to be here Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And then the last thing that's happening after second service today is Faith Expressions. This is our interpretive dance ministry that's led by Kipley Killen. An opportunity for individuals to use the gifts that God's given them through dance. And you don't have to have any experience. It's for all ages. And if that is something that interests you, plan to be back here about 12, 15 uh, after the second service today to join in with that group. I hope you've had a wonderful week. Eric prayed for us this morning. And so what we're going to do is take an opportunity to greet some folks today. So if you hadn't had a chance to speak to somebody this morning, why not take a moment, let them know you're glad they're here, and then our worship team will call us back together. But we're so glad that you're here this morning. All right, you can be seated. We're going to mix things up a little bit this morning. Some of you are thinking it is way too early to be mixing things up. We're going to change up a little bit this morning. We're going to start with the message. And so what I would invite you to do is find Psalms. We're going to be in the book of Psalms this morning. And it's also going to be up on the screen. We're going to be in Psalm 73. And so as you're finding that, Courtney, if you would be willing to come and read that for us. And as we think about what it means to be generous, part of what we have been talking about this month is, is this reality. Number one, that the church can spend a lot of time talking about giving. Uh, the, the other aspect of that is what we've been trying to do this month is shift a little bit from specifically talking about giving to talking about what it means to be generous. And so in Psalm 73, I want to invite you to hear the words of, of Asap as he's talking about getting caught up in the rat race of life and, and what it did to him and, and how it changed him. So Courtney, if you can come and read Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes inequity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Courtney. So the neat thing about doing the, the sermon first is whoever walks in late is going to think they are really late uh, to church this morning. So, and I'm the only one who gets to see that look when they walk in. I'll try my best to describe it for you uh, at the end of the service. Hey, we've been talking about giving this month, right? We, if you're new to Northside, we talk about giving once a year. And it culminates on Chest of Joash Sunday, which for us is, is next Sunday. And since the start of the church... Chest of Joash Sunday has been this opportunity for individuals who, who believe in the ministry of Northside, who are a part of the Northside family, to give something above and beyond their normal pattern of giving. Last year, we launched the Let Them Come campaign. And if you are participating in that, the next Sunday may be an opportunity for you to, to give towards the pledge that you've made. It's a perfect opportunity to step up and do that. If you haven't participated in Let Them Come, then maybe next Sunday is an opportunity to participate in that. 
All that's given next Sunday is going as a down payment on our children's center. And as we think about giving, I, I know that, that many people have their ideas of, of what they think is appropriate and their ideas of, of what it means to give something to the church or to give something to others. What I hope to, that we've done this month and what I hope that we're going to accomplish today is what does it look like to take a step back and not really even focus so much on giving to the church as much as it is what does a generous lifestyle look like? I think we can talk about giving all that we, we want but when we talk about generosity, generosity is a completely different perspective. Oftentimes, we define things by, by what they are. So if I asked you this morning, how would you define generosity? What would you say? What would your answer be? I suspect that we might could define it by what it's not, that, that generosity is not being greedy, that generosity is not being envious. A few years ago, there was a story that appeared in the New York Times guy who found himself addicted to money. And I want to read this story for you because in my mind, this young Wall Street trader sums up so much of what I think can happen when greed takes root in our life. Here is his words from that article. Eight years ago, I walked into the trading floor at a bank in Boston to begin my summer internship. I already knew I wanted to be rich. When I walked onto the trading floor for the first time and saw those glowing flat screen TVs, high tech computer monitors, and phone turrets, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was competitive and ambitious. I was a wrestler at Columbia University. After graduation, I got a job at Bank of America. I was sharp, clear eyed, and hardworking. At the end of my first year, I was thrilled when I received a $40,000 bonus. For the first time in my life, I didn't have to balance my checkbook before withdrawing money. Sounds like a good American success story, right? He goes on. Over the next few years, I worked like a maniac and climbed the corporate ladder. Four years later, I made $2 million a year. I rented a $6,000 per month apartment. I got myself a girlfriend. I could go to any restaurant in Manhattan or be second row at the Knicks and Lakers game just by picking up the phone. Still, I was nagged by envy. On a trading floor, everyone sits together. When the guy next to you makes 10 million, your 2 million doesn't look so sweet anymore. I went to work for a hedge fund, working elbow to elbow with billionaires, and became a giant fireball of greed. In my eighth year on Wall Street, which would have put him around the age of 30, my bonus, my bonus was $3.6 million. And I was angry because it wasn't enough. He writes that that ended up being his last year on Wall Street. He ended up leaving, and over the course of the next year, he talked about how hard it was for him to sleep at night, waking up in the middle of the night, not knowing if he was going to have enough money, scouring the newspapers to see which people he worked with who had gotten jobs or promotions. He said he would go out and buy lottery tickets just so he could have somewhat taste of, of what it meant to gamble a little bit and to maybe make a little bit more money. He talks about how that desire, that insatiable desire for more hasn't really gone away. I think about what he writes and I, I come to two conclusions. Number one is not many of us are going to make that kind of money in our lifetime. I read that and I, I can't relate to that. I can't relate what it's like to make $3.6 million as a bonus and still feel like you don't have enough. But what I can relate to is just how powerful greed and envy can be in my life. It doesn't matter whether I make $3.6 million or I don't. Greed and envy finds its place in our lives no matter who we are, no matter what kind of money we make, no matter what our issues or what our possessions may be. And greed and envy do things in our lives. The first thing it does is that it robs us of joy. When you are so focused on, on accumulating, when you're so focused on getting more, it robs you of joy. It also does something else. It keeps you from being generous. People who are jealous, people who are envious are often not capable of being generous with others because they fear that what they're going to let go of is something that they're going to need at some point. But here's the most important thing it does. It creates a wedge in your relationship with God. When you are focused on getting more, when you are focused on having more, when you are focused on being more, it sets up this dynamic in which your eyes can never be on God because your eyes are on yourself or your eyes are on those things that you don't have 
that you want. I think about what these twin killers are because some may see greed and envy as the same thing, but yet they're, they're different. They're both a violation of the 10th commandment. Moses writes in Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So how can we define envy this morning? I think a lot of people think of it as being coveting or covetness. How, how actually do we define envy? Here's the definition. It is simply an inappropriate desire for something that someone else has. How many of you have seen a child be envious? Because their brother, their sister, their cousin has something that all of a sudden they want. How many of you have seen adults become envious? Because the Joneses or the Smiths up the street got something and all of a sudden we take a step back and begin thinking, well, I want that too. I need that too. It's interesting that envy is addressed in the Ten Commandments because I think many of us would take a step back and say, I don't think envy, being envious is as bad as idolatry. I don't think it's as bad as murder. It's not as bad as adultery. It's not as bad as stealing, is it? And yet Moses lists it. And the very last, you shouldn't covet your neighbor's wife. You shouldn't covet their spouse. You shouldn't covet their possessions. You shouldn't covet what they own. So how is greed and envy different? I would tell you that greed is about having more. Envy is about being more. I think greed is looking at success... <coughs> and thinking, I want to have more success in my life. Envy is about being more successful. Greed is about more for you. Envy is about less for your neighbor. Greed delights in good fortune. Envy delights in your neighbor's misfortune. Greed is about stuff. Being envious is about status. Greed prompts us to compare ourselves to others, while being envious prompts us to compete with others. Greed is that thing that causes you to look across your neighbor's fence and look at how green their grass is and say, man, I want that kind of grass. I need that kind of grass. Envy is looking across at your neighbor's grass and thinking, I just want it to die. Because you don't want them to be successful. You don't want them to have everything that looks good. You don't want them to be the center of attention. If envy is, is this desire for things that belong to someone else that don't belong to you, then, then how would we define greed? I think greed is this insatiable desire for more than you need. Greed is this thing that keeps you going, that keeps your blood focused on something that if you were honest with yourself, you really don't need it in your life. But somehow you've convinced yourself that you have to have it. Before I met Shoshana, and I, I've shared this with many of you guys, I, I, would, I couldn't sleep at night. I, have, and I still have trouble sleeping at night. And so I would channel surf and I would land on these infomercials. And, and I would just convince myself that whatever they were selling were things that I had to have in order to make my life a little bit better. I don't know what a single person needs to set it and forget it for. Do you remember those things that you cooked with? But I was convinced that if I had that in my life, things would be better. I would use it. And I really did set it and forget it. I never used it at all. So when you think about what it means to be greedy, John Ortberg writes, he calls it the myth of more. This idea that if I could just have a little bit more, then I'm going to be satisfied. He says this in his last book. He says, we suffer from a phenomenon called reference anxiety, or more often referred to as keeping up with the Joneses. We don't ask if our homes and cars meet our needs. We ask if they are nicer than our neighbors. We work like crazy to make it so, but what do you do? And here's his question. What do you do when the Joneses refinance? Well, you probably do the exact same thing, so you can afford more. Listen to some of the symptoms of greed, and let's do an assessment this morning. I know these are hard things to hear, but let's, let's take a step back and do a little assessment in our lives. I, I think people who focus on, on greed or people who are pursuing greed, whether they realize it or not, have this preoccupation with money. They let the cost of something keep them from enjoying it, or they take a job or a promotion simply because of the money. People who are, are greedy often have compulsive spending. They buy things because they're bored or depressed or simply because they're on sale. I think people who are prone to being greedy also hoard. They buy more than they need. They hang on to things simply so they'll have them. I think people who struggle with greed deal a lot with conspicuous consumption. 
They buy things so that people will know that they have them. It becomes about status or simply because they can. I think people who struggle with greed, they, they live in a miserly kind of way. They deprive themselves or their family of necessities. They're stingy with gifts. When the tip, when time comes to tip someone, they are looking for every reason not to justify giving a tip to someone. I think people who suffer from being greedy often overspend. They live beyond their means. They carry massive credit card debt. They take improbable risk in their lives. They invest recklessly. They gamble recklessly. And, and I don't know if any of those touch close to your heart this morning. I, I, in reading them, I know some of those touch close to mine. And, and I look at greed, and I don't know that any of us are immune from it. I don't know that any of us can say, well, I walk through life, and I'm not greedy when I look at things that I don't have or I see things that I want more of. If that's being, being greedy or if that's a symptom <coughs> of being greedy, then what does being envious look like? If greed is an insatiable desire for more than you need, being envious is this incurable fear that other people have it better than you. Greed is often driven by desire. Envy is often driven by fear, by feeling insecure or being inferior to other people. Greed often allows us to compare ourselves with others. We look at what other people have and, and we want what they have or, or we feel like we need what they have. Envy is looking at other people and trying to compete with them. One of the things I would tell you is that there are a lot of pastors who suffer from, from being envious. They look at other churches or they look at other buildings and they, they, they become envious. And, and there are some who even want misfortune for those churches because they want what others have. And, and so in a lot of ways, Christians are often the ones that, that need to be holding up the mirror when we're talking about being greedy and envious. Jealousy and envy are, are different. Jealousy is holding on to what you have, and there's times where that's appropriate. God says that he's jealous for us. We should be jealous for our spouses. We should be jealous for those things in our life that bring about holiness. Envy, though, envy is different. En envy is looking at things and coming to a conclusion that if I can't have them, no one's going to have them. I think about a, an old legend that was told of these two men who were warring with one another, and they go to this very wise king. And this wise king says, I will grant both of you a wish, but because you have been fighting with one another, whatever you wish for, your enemy is going to get double. And so he looks to the first soldier and he says, what is it that you would wish for? And the soldier thought, well, if I ask for wealth, then this individual is going to get wealth. Or if I ask for fame, this individual is going to get double that. And so this individual took a step back and thought about it for a minute, and he asked to be blind in one eye. That's what envy does. Envy looks at individuals that have more than us, and we come to a conclusion that they don't deserve it, or that if we had it, we would do it better, or we deserve it in our lives. And envy is deadly. It is deadly. It led to Cain killing Abel. It led to the Pharisees killing Jesus. And if we're not careful, guys, it can lead to us being separated from God because at the end of the day, envy and greed really are idolatry. So, so the question for us this morning is that if you find yourself at a place where you're prone to being greedy or you're prone to being envious, how do you move to a place of contentment? How, how do you move to a place where what's in front of you is, is, is exactly what you need? You, d you don't need it bigger. You don't need it better. That you can be satisfied with what you have in life. While they are very different, Paul seems to write later in Colossians that they are both very similar. He says in Colossians 3, 5, this is his advice to the church. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Listen to the things he lumps together. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Keeping that verse up here for a minute. Evil desires and greed. What does that sound a lot like? Evil desire sounds a lot like envy, doesn't it? And, and greed, well, greed is greed. And Paul is making this connection that both of those when they are at the center of your life, when they run your life, like sexual immorality can, like lust can, like all these other things that Paul writes about, the reality is, is that they 
can ruin your life. They can become gods in your life because they compel us to look to other things to find our joy and contentment rather than our creator. They force us to look at possessions as being the things that will satisfy us when only God alone is the one who brings satisfaction and joy in our life. I would tell you this morning when, when we struggle with greed, and this is Adrian putting on his psychoanalytic hat this morning, when we struggle with greed, what we are really after in life is contentment. And so we're continually pursuing things, just trying to fill this void that somehow has gone missing in our heart. We try to fill it with things. You show me a greedy person, I'll show you a person that's struggling with contentment. You show me an envious person, I'll show you a person who's struggling with security. That people just want security in their life. And if they feel like they can just get something or get this or deprive someone else of that, they will have security in their life. And so they're looking at these things in their life that only God can bring. Only God can bring contentment in our lives. Only God can bring security in our lives. The reason why we know this to be true is, is exactly what Courtney read for us this morning. I, I want you to hear this again. I want you to hear the despair in, in Asaph. Asaph was a, a worship leader for the Israelites. Listen to what he says in Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. The question is why? All of us are going to slip in life. All of us are going to lose our foothold in life, right? The question is why? And he gives us the answer. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. How many of us feel this way about those who have it better than us? They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. Is that, is that reality? No. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. What is he talking about there? These guys, these people think they're good, and others think they're good as well. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God... No. Does the Most High know anything? And this is what he finishes with. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. I don't know if you could hear it. I, I certainly could. I could hear his unhappiness. I could hear the feelings of insecurity. I could hear the feelings of not being content with where he was in life. I think ASAP lost sight of a God who brings contentment. I think ASAP lost sight of a God who brings security in our lives. The, the question is, how do you break free from it? How do you break free from this rat race in life of wanting to have more, of wanting to keep up, of believing or somehow convincing yourself that if I could just get this, I'll feel secure in life. Or if I could just hold on to this, then I'm going to be okay well, thank God that ASAP doesn't leave us there. He says this in verse 16, when I tried to understand all this, what is he saying? When I was in the place that all of us are this morning, when I was comprehending this, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. What is he saying in that passage of Scripture? There is something about coming into a sanctuary that propels us to look up, that should cause us to recognize that this life and all that comes with it is fleeting, that all that makes it up is going to one day go away. You talk to people who have amassed great wells, and a lot of them struggle in life with being happy, and they are so fearful. Why? They're fearful they're going to lose what they have. And, and you read what Asaph is saying, and he, he's acknowledging this. He's acknowledging that if you're driven by stuff, if you're driven by accumulation, then what's going to grow is not your security. What's going to grow is not your contentment. What's going to grow is your worry. 
What's going to grow is your frustrations. What's going to grow is this insatiable desire for more, to have more, to accumulate more. And Asaph is saying that when I walked into the church, when I walked into the temple and I saw the smoke rise from the altar, I recognized that that's my life. It is a vapor. And one day it's going to go away. And all of this that I've been working for, all of this that, that I've tried to accumulate isn't going to matter, isn't going to mean anything. We have so many illustrations before us of, of people who have lost it all. Of people whose lives centered around more, the word more. And they're left with nothing. What's the antidote to greed and envy? I, I would tell you it's generosity. It's, it's amazing when you can break the, the hold that greed and envy have on your life and release it. And, and I'm not just talking about giving to the church. I'm talking about giving to others. I'm talking about being generous with others. When, when you are able to break those chains of, of, of greed and envy that, that ensnarl people and you're able to be generous, it does something to your heart. It changes your life. I would tell you that generosity is that, that healthy habit that frees us from greed. We know wealthy people who are happy. We know wealthy people who aren't. What, why is it that some wealthy people are happy? Well, I, I would tell you that I think it's probably because they're generous in life. It's interesting. I sit in on behavioral rounds at our hospital with psychiatrists and psychologists, and I don't know if these individuals are Christian, but they talk about the idea of, of people who are struggling with behavioral health or people who have behavioral health tendencies, and we all do. When people are generous, when people give, it lights up things in their brain. It does something to you. When you go and you help someone, when you do something for someone else, it could be as simple as opening a door. It could be as drastic as paying off a car loan for someone. Whatever it is, there is something that lights up in our life when we help other people. And, and I would tell you that that's the antidote to greed. If you're starting to find yourself being pulled in, into this idea that you've got to have more, what would it look like to make a concerted effort to do something for someone else rather than for yourself? If you find yourself being prone to wishing harm or evil upon people who seemingly are more successful than you, what would it look like to take a step back and pray for God's blessing on them and to want good in their life? And to be happy for them. That's generosity. I would tell you that the other antidote to greed and envy is, is gratitude. It's hard to be greedy and envious when you're filled with gratitude for what you already have. Let me ask you this morning, how, how many of you are truly grateful for what you have in your life? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it takes a, taking a step back to recognize that, doesn't it? When, when you, you look back and you think, you know, I really do have all that I need. I, I've been blessed with, with another day of life. I've got friends and family in my life that I know love me and care for me. I, I, I'm able to come to, to worship with people that I care about, that I enjoy seeing. I, 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 I am a very fulfilled person. And sometimes, guys, we need to take those moments to pray three times a day before a meal. Sometimes we need to take moments to, when we wake up in the morning to thank God for another day, and when we close our eyes at night to ask Him to watch over us. Sometimes we need to keep a journal beside our bedside and remind ourselves of when God has answered prayers in our life. Gratitude does so much for people. And when you take a step back and you just look at your life, even though it may not be everything that you want, even though it may not be filled with everything that you desire, I would say that most of us have got it really, really good. And we have so much to be thankful for. The idea that greed and envy will make you happier is a farce. I don't know if you saw the story on WREL yesterday of the local financial investor who was sentenced to 40 years in prison for bilking people in our, our community out of a lot of money. And I was struck by the fact that the judge made this statement at his sentencing. She said, greed had consumed you. Greed had consumed you. 
I think many of us would say that we know greed when we see it, but the reality is, is that it might find itself closer to our heart at times than we realize. And, and listen to how Asaph finishes this up. In Psalm 73, he's closing down this, this experience in his life. He says, look, guys, I know what it was like to be greedy. I know what it was like to be filled with envy. I would look at the people around my life who had so much, and I was so envious of them until, until I walked in the sanctuary, until I walked into that congregation of believers, and I recognized that at the end of the day, God is who he says he is. And he is the one who's able to bring contentment. He is the one who is able to bring satisfaction in my life. And here's how he finishes in verse 25 and verse 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. Can you say that this morning? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. As for me, it is good to be near to God. I would tell you that I think one of the things that ASAP has come to a realization is that whether he realized it or not, at the end he came to this understanding that God really was enough for him. So here's the challenge this week, guys. All of us are going to go out, and at some point we're going to see something that piques our interest, something that we convince ourselves we need or have to have. And maybe you do. I'm not telling you to go without bread and milk and different things in your life. What I am saying is what are those things that if you were to take a step back and really be honest with yourself, do you need it? Do you have to have it? And, and what would it look like, whether it's the resources or the energy, what would it look like to channel that desire into being generous for someone else? What would it, it look like to, to suspend your desires, my desires? What would it look like to suspend it long enough to do something for someone else? I'm promising you the Lord will bless your heart for it. And the joy and satisfaction that you will feel is something that that possession will never be able to give you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the generosity that you show to us. Thank you for giving us Christ. Lord, we, we were given something that we could never purchase on our own and something that, that would never be of, of the same value. And Father, you, you gave your Son willingly and freely to us. God, I, I don't doubt that there's people here this morning, maybe even people listening, who don't know you. And, and the, the ultimate act of, of holding on to everything in their life is that they've never given their heart to you. It's always been about their desires. It's always been about their plan. And Lord, maybe they're, they're at a place in their life where they realize that, that their plans, their desires are failing them. That they're not fulfilled. They're not finding joy in their life. God, I, I pray this morning that you'd speak to their heart and that their heart would turn to you. I thank you that you were so faithful to us. I thank you, Father, that you never leave us. I thank you that you never forsake us. And so, Lord, this morning, as, as we consider what Asaph is saying to us, that we are so prone to look at other things and, and to look at other people and to judge our life by what we have or what others have. Lord, I pray that we would be measured by our generosity. Lord, when we're tempted to find contentment and possessions, help us to know that our contentment ultimately comes from you. When we're prone to look at others' success and to wish harm upon them or to take delight in their struggles, Lord, remind us that you love them just as much as you love us. Father, for, for all that you are in our lives, for all that you promise to be in saving us, Lord, I, I pray that we would be people who pursue you. I pray that we would be Christ followers who, who desire to be known by our generosity. 
Because generosity really does come from a place of love. Love for you, and Father, love for our neighbors. So Lord, may you, you speak to us today. May you move in our hearts. May you have your way in our life. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite our worship team up. I know we were experiencing some challenges this morning with technology. Not sure that they're working yet. But you know what? You don't have to have a screen to worship the Lord, do you? So if it's working, then it's a miracle. You saw a miracle today. That's, if it's not working, nothing's going to hold us back from it either. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And let's, let's find freedom in this time. If the Lord's working in your heart, or if there's prayers that, that are, are close to you this morning, people that you want to lift up, maybe it has nothing to do with greed. Maybe it has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. But there is someone on your heart this morning that you want to lift up in prayer, or some need in your life this morning that you want to lift up. Let's spend this time, as we're worshiping together, let's spend this time praying as well. And if you want to pray together in this season, I am right here. We can pray together for whatever is going on in your life. Or you can move and find others as the Lord lays them on your heart. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord together this morning. Church, I'm going to begin my reading Psalm 51. This comes from verses 1 through 11. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the state of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Sing it out, church, to you. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. Your fire fall down to you. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall. Let your praise, let your praise be your welcome. Let our song be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your praise. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one 
out to you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Our New Testament reading comes from 1 Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst sinner of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Let's lift our voices together, church. Let's sing, You Are Holy. You are holy. You are holy. 
You are mighty. You are mighty. And you are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. And I will follow. together you are holy you are holy you are holy you are mighty you are mighty you are worthy you are worthy worthy of praise worthy of praise and I will follow of peace now will live my life for you
with me. God, thank you for being present with us. And you call us to be generous with our lives because you demonstrate what that looks like for us in Christ. You give of yourself constantly, and everything we have is because of you. So you demonstrate yourself to be trustworthy, God pray you give us the courage and boldness to step out in faith, to enact our faith by loving each other. Whatever that looks like and whatever that costs us, it costs you everything. God, you make us new and you make us whole. I pray that we would see ourselves in each other, to see you in each other that we might be generous in all things, not to be fearful or afraid because we lack something that we think we need, but to be hopeful in what you're doing in our lives and what your kingdom is in our presence because you're with us always. God, help us to be with each other, whatever we're facing, whatever we're going through because it's all about you. You alone are worthy. You alone establish life, establish faith, perfect it from beginning to end. Where can we go from your presence, God? Your love is with us always. God, I pray that our hope would be secure solely in Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit at work within us, not because of the things and securities we may think we have in this life, God or the people in our lives, God, but to know that you alone are at work in them as a gift for us that we might get back to you and how we treat each other. May your love be present among us. God, we ask and pray these things that you may be glorified in us and that we may become one as you pray for us. In the name of Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, we pray and all the church said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much again for, for being here this morning. As you go out to your week, there's going to be opportunities to be generous. And as we come up on, on Chest of Joe West Sunday, I want to leave you with this benediction. And it, and it says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, everyone.